Hi. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Hello. Um, I'd, I'd like to introduce Chris Anderson, um, who's the, the head of TED. Um, under Chris's stewardship, um, there's been more than 2,500 talks and lessons released free uh, on the TED website, with 100,000 more on YouTube. Yada, yada. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I went to... Um, I, I met Chris for the first time in 2012. I was invited to give a TED talk about psychopaths in Long Beach. <laughs> and, um, no, not, not psychopaths in Long Beach. No, yeah. Yeah. although God the knows with was, yeah. people who come to... <laughs> business yeah. leaders who come to your... come to TED, I mean, Jesus. It's fine, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yes. Um, <laughs> It was very exciting. I, I, um, I felt for the first time that I was in a room where, you know, partly because of the interesting people on the stage with all of their interesting ideas and then the incredibly powerful people in the audience, the Bill Gateses and the Larry Pages. So, you know, this, this, what was happening in that room that week had the potential to change the world a little bit for the better, is what I thought. And, and I think the world did change a little bit that week. Uh, Susan Cain gave a very famous talk about introverts mm. um, and about how to make the workplace more introvert-friendly. What I remember about that was um, Chris got up on stage after Susan Cain gave her talk about introverts and basically said, everybody give Susan Cain another round of applause because as an introvert, it must be so hard to be on this stage and talk in front of all these thousands of people. And when he said that, I, I thought, when I was talking to Susan Kane backstage, I was the one who was so nervous that I destroyed my lanyard, yet <laughs> nobody gave me an extra round of applause. <laughs> I, could, could we correct that right now, actually? John Ronson, <laughs> oh, he's amazing! You guys. <laughs> um, the other thing that happened, the other really noticeable thing that happened that week was, was Brian Stevenson, the civil rights mm. lawyer, gave a talk that just like blew the room away and, could, and I think probably completely changed his life. You got up on stage afterwards and said, OK, who's going to donate to Brian Stevenson's... Um, who's going to give a million dollars? And all of these hands were like... And I was like, shit, John, I fucking don't... <laughs> scratch your nose. Um, anyway, the reason why I say all of that is because... Chris is in a world where, where things do change as a result. And, it's, and I think there's a world in which Chris's uh, new book, Infectious Generosity, which is fascinating and sometimes provocative, and I think we'll get into some of the provocative stuff a little bit later, um, if it's implemented by regular users and tech utopians and heads of industry, the, the world could change a little bit for the better. So I thought we could start, uh, I've, I've given just a couple of paragraphs, if you just wanted to read a couple of paragraphs from the introduction, which just really lays, it just yeah. kind of stakes the book's claim. Thank you, John. It's so nice to see everyone here. Honestly, at London, I love being back here. Okay. One of the surprises of the internet age is that generous acts can often turn out to be the smartest, most satisfying decisions an organization can make. We're taught to think of generosity as an act done purely for selfless reasons. But I'll make the case that it can be much more than that. Today, more than ever, the decision to be generous can simultaneously be an act of sacrifice and, profoundly, an act in the long-term self-interest of the giver. The people who are generous are the people who will come to enjoy the deepest happiness, and the companies and organizations that are generous are the companies and organizations that will own the future. I think I should stop there. I think, okay. I think that's, that's, you know, it needs justifying, that's the thing. It doesn't sound credible by itself. I'd, if I was in the audience, I'd be going, come on. That's ridiculous. Well, that's hopefully what we're going to be doing over the next <laughs> hour and 20 minutes, is, is justify those, that idea. Um, okay, so most of this conversation will be about Chris's ideas for how to put things right. But as you say in the book, if we're going to figure that out, then it's also important to figure out what went wrong and mm. why. And you, more than almost anyone on earth, 
has had very close access to all of the major architects of the internet. Everyone from Larry Page to Elon Musk have given TED Talks, and I'm sure you know a lot of them personally as well. Um, so what is it about their characters and their business plans that led to the chaos that we now live in? So it's, it's a painful and important question. Um, I have been a tech optimist most of my life, actually, and, and certainly in the 90s and in the aughts, I was all in on the internet. It was humankind's greatest invention ever. Hello, it connected everyone on the planet. We could see each other for the first time. We could therefore come to learn each other's stories. Divisions were going to be reduced, and uh, history, the arc of history was going to arc in the right direction. Thank you, internet. And then, starting around about 2010, maybe 2013, we've, we've entered this decade of just crushing dismay, disappointment. Mm -hmm. um, it's been horrible. And yeah, I had a front row seat of a, of a lot of it. I, I think this, the single biggest thing that has gone wrong is social media. I don't think it was a giant evil conspiracy of a bunch of people behind doors saying, we've got a great plan to get rich, let's do all these ads and hook people and turn them into evil people. I think it was a screw-up. I think it was a monumental screw-up um, caused by a naive view of human nature. I think a lot of the designers of the internet kind of grew up hippie generation, you know, people are basically good. Um, if we could just empower people, what could go wrong? And so social media platforms were designed to say, hey, here's an idea. Let's build super powerful algorithms that notice what people click on and do and how long their eyeballs stay on certain things. And let's optimize our content so that those things get amplified. We're maximizing user choice. What could possibly go wrong? And what could possibly go wrong is that people aren't just good. We're complicated. We have, we have goodness in all of us. We also have instincts, really strong instincts, that can be triggered and turned ugly very quickly. Um, Danny Kahneman, the psychologist, talks in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, it talks about our system one and system two thinking. System one is our instinctive selves, system two is our reflective selves. The social media platforms are designed for system one, also known as our lizard brains. Um, it's our lizard brain that clicks on like and is, is addicted to doom scrolling. Um, so, if you amplify that, and the algorithms have done a brilliant job of amplifying that and grabbing our attention, the trouble is that we have amplified the voices of those who know how to trigger lizard brains. And the way you trigger a lizard brain is to present a threat. That's what we evolved to do. That's how we survived. We're very, very, very good at spotting threats. And so we have come, and social media has played a terrifyingly powerful role in doing this, as seeing the world as full of threat. And it's divided us into tribes who distrust and hate each other. And I'm terrified by it. I'm terrified by it. You say that you don't think any of this was deliberate and really they were just focused, they were young people fo wanted to focus on just building cool stuff. And that is borne out in some ways by you know, something that uh, Jack Dorsey said quite recently. I heard an interview with him where he said, oh, maybe we should have, at the beginning of Twitter, maybe we should have employed some social scientists to model how this might go. And when I heard that, I thought, you think? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that does speak to a kind of almost childlike naivety, like children crawling towards a gun. Um, but, I'm, but I think there was something more nefarious at work too, I should say. You know, I, I saw the documentary The Social Dilemma, yeah. Yeah. and there's a moment in that documentary where they say that they presented Larry Page with data saying, look, look what this is doing. It's making people more addicted. And he turned the other way. And I, and I know that, you know, Twitter hates, so you've been publicly shamed. Like somebody, a friend of mine asked, Megan Phelps Roper um, was on a call with them, with Twitter, and, and they wanted her to give a talk because she was de-radicalized. She was part of the Westboro Baptist Church, and she went on Twitter to like, proselytize, and Twitter changed her mind. Twitter de-radicalized her. Yeah. So that was a great Twitter story. So they were on the phone with her, wanting her to give a talk, and she said, uh, well, why don't you ask John Ronson to give a talk? 
And she said, when, they, when she said my name, everyone else on the call went very quiet. <laughs> so this speaks to you know, something more nefarious than, than naivety. It speaks to looking the other way. It also speaks to an ideology. The internet was built by libertarians who just didn't want any restrictions on their machines. The machines must be allowed to flourish however the machine can, and any restrictions is, is bad. I mean, there's definitely a school of thought that is libertarian. There's definitely a commercial issue, which is that this has been phenomenally successful as a business model. You've been able to monetize all that attention with, with ad revenue. But I'm not willing to give up on the internet, no. And, I, and I've talked to a lot of people inside these companies who are also not willing to give up. Inside each of these companies, there is a huge debate going on because most people, most of the people who actually create value in the companies, AKA anyone who can code or do anything creative, doesn't want to work for an evil company. Yeah. They don't. And so, they, so they, they are trying to figure out what it is that they could do that would ease the problem. And the tr trouble is it's not, it's not obvious. It really isn't obvious how you fix this stuff because they are going with human choices. Mm. It's, it's humans, you know, they have empowered us to do this to each other. And it's, it's quite hard to say, you know, what do you do? Do you, sh if you, if you take a bunch of people offline who are being really nasty, then you're violating free speech. It's not like there's an easy way. What, but I do think there, there is a way. And you know, it, it, it fundamentally comes to figuring out how you use the algorithms to connect with our reflective selves instead of our instinctive selves. Mm -hmm. Give that some power. That will actually create platforms that people are proud of having on their phone, are excited to have as part of their life instead of it being this, I don't know if you feel this, but I, I'm simultaneously addicted to social media to some extent. And some of it I love, but partly I come off it and go, yeah, you know, mm. did I really do that? Did I spend all that time? I, th there's a pathway where you could have a service that gets past quite a bit of that. And, and if they can do that, they may take a short-term profits hit. Long-term, things are going to be better. So I, I refuse to give up on this. If you give up, John, we're done. Like, as I, I genuinely believe that we will not solve any of the other problems facing us if we can't figure out how to rebuild a little bit of trust, a little bit of belief in humanity. I, I think this is an existential problem. Um, and, and, you know, so I, I, I didn't write this book to be, oh, let's have a little kumbaya kindness. I'm really worried, and I, and I think we have to fight back against the toxic memes and nastiness that is spreading online with trying to make the good stuff compelling. Mm. That's what it boils down to. And happily, much of your book is dedicated to practical ways to, to do that. Um, and the good news, as you say, is that people are very worried and are craving for ways to connect. So there is a receptive audience out there, not just within the tech companies, but also within the, the users of the internet. You know, I, I put out the show, Things Fell Apart, um, to the BBC, and, and the, in the first season, the, the, the episode that people really loved was the episode about connection, about two warring factions, mm. uh, a, past, a, a pastor with AIDS going on the chat show of a televangelist, and the whole point of that story was, a, was, a, was about how wars can end and people can come together. And that was the episode that really moved people more than any other. So I think, yeah, people are sick of, of, of all the horror and are looking for some kind of connection. So I think this book is coming out at, at a good time. <laughs> um, you, you've definitely, you've documented the issues better than anyone. I mean, you've, you've been right in there. You've seen the damage that it can cause someone, how shaming can ruin someone's life and how the right kind of bridging can, I mean, it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of wisdom to figure out the right way to do it. But it can actually happen, and when it does, wow. Yeah, and actually later on, there's the, the, I'd say the clearly most provocative part of your book is making an argument, and it's a very nuanced argument, but you're making an argument that the surveillance culture on the internet, feeling that you're being watched, feeling that if you do the wrong thing can get you publicly shamed, has its upsides, and, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, I think. Okay.
Uh, Just for a later. I think save it for later. Because, I mean, I did think it was fascinating. And, uh, you know, much of your argument, I, I think, has, has a lot of merit, but I want to push back on some of it. Um, but before we do that, um, the business model of giving things away. You start the book um, with something very interesting from your own life. Um, you say sensibly that, that generosity is in the self-interest of the person being generous, and that's a point that you make over and over again, which I think is a really good and interesting point. Because um, you say, look, if you do this, this will benefit you in ways that you don't even realise. Um, and, and, and by the way, people hearing that, some people will be going, ew, that's not what I think of as generosity. That's, that's, mm. that's just transactional stuff. Tra generosity is supposed to just be for generosity's sake. And, and, and I actually think it's a, like, it's a really, really important point to debate because um, you know, the, the argument is, is that in this connected age, there is always stuff that comes back. If we use that as a reason to snark about someone's generosity, we're done, we're gonna find nothing good in anyone. And, and actually, we should celebrate it. Generosity is often, like it's hard to do short term. Long term, in this connected age, it can bring back huge, huge benefits, mm. including reputation, including many other things. Um, and so you can point to mixed motivation, we should not, we should celebrate it. And so yes, it's in people's long term interest to be generous, that doesn't mean it's easy to do in the moment. Yes. No, I thought, you, I thought that was a very good thing that you do in your book, is saying this isn't some sort of hippie wellness right. bullshit. Right. This is actually something that can benefit you, both in terms of your mental health and also in terms of your business. And, and I thought that was you know, a good and interesting point. Um, and one of the ways that you talk about that is what you did with TED. You, um, at the beginning of TED, you... Um, um, realised that you could broadcast the videos on the internet and you decided to do that for, for free. And then you went even further and you gave away the whole brand. You, you gave everybody in the world the opportunity to host their own TED event. Those were big, there must have been opposition and you must have thought this could go, you know, yeah. terribly wrong. Yeah, definitely. It was, it was a little scary. Um, TED, back in early 2000s, was a, was a once-a-year conference, technology, entertainment, design. Um, I took it over with a, through a foundation that had some money in it. Very exciting to do, but we, we spent a long time trying to figure out how to get it out there in the world. When online video came along, there was a chance to do it, but there was a risk that if we put them out there, it would kill the conference. Mm. And so... Yeah, the, the only money you were making, I guess, was people paying tickets. to go to the conference. No, I, 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 absolutely. Um, but... We were a non-profit, felt like the right thing to do. We did it, we'd listened to TED Talks, we'd drunk the Kool-Aid. The internet wants stuff to be free, so we put it out there. And to our amazement, um, demand for the conference rose because these talks went, went viral. And, and so yeah, so since then, this idea of in the connected age, give it away and be amazed at what happens next became, I would say, our strategy. Radical mm -hmm. generosity, our strategy, and, and the argument of the book is that that is a strategy that any individual can apply and any organization can apply. And it's, 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 it's so beautiful when it works. So the TEDx thing, we gave away the brand. Harvard Business Review wrote this article, How TED Lost Control of Its Crowd. Ha ha. Um, they were right. And some really embarrassing things happened. And it was great. There were some crazy TEDx talks. There were some crazy <laughs> and embarrassing TEDx talks. We were ashamed. I was <laughs> taunted on, on Twitter yeah. and elsewhere. But you must have had some, you must have had some um, guardrails, like if something was especially nuts, it, it wouldn't no, go online. We, we have policies against pseudoscience and you know, religion and so forth being used in, in, in TED. It wasn't the platform for that, and sometimes those things were ignored. Um, but, the, but, the, but the amazing thing is that the vast majority of events were loved by people, the talks were great, and you end, we ended up with 3,000 of these teams around the world. So right now, I mean, TED is 200 people in New York, employees, and more than 60,000 volunteers around the world. Translators and... Translators and TEDx organizers putting, doing stuff for us out of their own love of ideas. 
it's, it's, it's incredible, and it's only happened because we decided to give stuff away. Um, and most of these events are loved. You get 25,000 videos a year from it. Many of the best, your favorite TED speakers came up through TEDx. Brene Brown? Yeah, Brene Brown, Simon Sinek, um, many, many, many of, of, like people who we would never have dared to put on stage turn out to be amazing. Um, and um, so I just, it just, if, even if TED hadn't been a nonprofit, if we'd been a business, this would have been the smartest possible thing we could have done. And so it just, it just really hit me how, because we're connected, all of these things can happen when you give something away. One, it can spread to an indefinite number of people. Two, the total cost of that distribution is zero. That's unbelievable. And three, these gifts carry with them reputation. Mm. So it's, it, they're com a complete game changer. And, and ripples too. And by the way, can I ask, like, financially giving stuff away? I mean, does that mean that Ted made, like, billions? <laughs> no. So, so you have to be, you have to think about it and do it and do it smart. Like, there are some things you could give away that would destroy your business. In the case of, of TEDx, the licenses are free, um, didn't charge for them. What we do get is rights to the videos. So. The event organizers upload the videos on YouTube. There is some ad revenue from those videos. That comes to TED. That plays for part of the cost of the program. The rest is funded mostly philanthropically by people who just like the idea of us having all these events around the world. Mm. Um, and, but you have, to, you have to, you know, when we said with TEDx, it works because of rules and tools. Um, rules on how you have to use the format. Tools on just encouraging people. Here is how you put on a good event. This is all we know. Take this knowledge and, and run with it. And I think any, any act, I mean, I, I really encourage in the book anyone to spend, if you're an organizational company, or even as an individual or family, spend a day brainstorming what is the most radical thing we could give away. And um, uh, but be smart about it. And yeah. you may be amazed at what happens next. So this is your advice to, to creators. Um, give, you say this in the book, give away your best thing. Yeah. And it's really hard for creators, because there are a lot of creators out there who are fighting tooth and nail just to survive, just to pay the rent. And, well, and right, because, you know, as we know, in capitalism, people are bastards. And, and <laughs> just look at what's happening on, on Spotify. I mean, you know, they just want to rip you off. I'm not saying Spotify in particular, to, but just the general model of, you know, getting tiny royalties for... I know things were maybe a bit too bloated in the old DVD days, but... Yeah. You, you know, now people want, there's, there's a lot of sharks out there who will exploit that generosity. There are. And there are a lot of people who, as a receiver of all this content, we may feel they're just an influencer using gross tactics to try and get my attention and to win money from sponsors. But definitely, we've moved so quickly into a world in which there's this inpouring of amazing free stuff. Mm. And, and so I think a few things. I think one thing, just take a moment to be amazed by that. I mean, it, it is incredible what you have access to right now, and we should view it to some extent through the lens of generosity and make an effort to reward the people who are giving us all this amazingness. Because things like Patreon are actually really interesting. For some creators, they are making a meaningful difference to them. Mm. Um, they, you know, and so I can, part of me can see a way of us moving slowly to a generosity economy where creators create and give and we respond with gratitude and, and, and with money. I've got to say, I, I found that one of the most in, inspiring and persuasive parts of the book, like the idea you know, that, that, that there could be a whole new type of economy, there could be a gift economy where that happens and, and yeah, you get rewards in unconventional ways, but they're very tangible rewards. I, I, I think that, that's a persuasive argument. You know, I do worry about the, the sharks out there, but that is a, and, and it's happened, you know, there's been great ripples from TED Talks. People have set up their own events and the ripples continue. Yeah. So, I mean, some people have made it work, many others still. It's, it's a huge struggle, and there are far more people struggling trying to make a living this way than, than not. But, but I still think that even for those people, the, taking the risk of giving away something big and bold and surprising. The problem with the, with the internet is, you know, there's so much noise. To get something to go viral, you have to do something surprising that cuts through it. And it's possible that by doing that, 
you will suddenly get a lot greater attention from a lot more people that will build an audience that will allow you to provide your regular business in some way. It's, it's a different story in each case. Mm. Um, but what I do know is that in all the noise, there are many examples of amazing generosity happening when people have done extraordinary work and they've just decided to share it with the world. And, and we're, all, we're all beneficiaries of that. Mm. Including them? I think including them. I think including them. Mm. Um, I think, I, and you're right, I mean, people are doing well on Substack and, and Patreon and, and so on. But I, but I do think it's only certain sorts of people. It's, it's people who produce a lot of stuff. Like, you, you, if you're paying £50 a year, you want, you want stuff in your feed once or twice a week. Mm. I think for people like me, who, you know, Joe Rogan produces three hours of content a day, I produce three hours of content a year. So I think for people like me, who's, you know, like a dollhouse maker, it's maybe yeah. harder. It's going to be harder to get people yeah. to subscribe. Those three hours are pretty cool, though. I, I mean, they aren't, <laughs> like, no, seriously, and mm. talking about cutting through the noise, so you're three hours, if I, if I heard the numbers right, have attracted an audience of over like five million for, for some of your latest podcasts. Five million people. That is astonishing. That is because you have become one of the most talked about podcasts out there. If you cut your effort back by, say, 40%, I don't think your audience would be down 40% from that. It might be a tenth of that. Mm. It's the, the, the amazing thing about virality is that, that everything hangs on getting to that lift-off point. Um, and it, you know, if, if 10 people spread word to 11 people, as opposed to nine people, the difference between those two scenarios is 10,000-fold. And so that incremental 20% of effort is the key. And for those of us who, who are in the business of wanting to spread good stories online, kindness, and so forth. Everything hangs on trying to be smart about directing it to how do you do something that isn't just worthy and nice, but takes people's breath away. Yes. Well, that takes me to my next area of questioning, um, how to make acts of generosity go viral. You say, um, let's be generous in a way that gives people goosebumps, making generosity go viral. Uh, and, and an example you give, you give two examples of, of when it's done right and when it's done wrong. And, and a very good example you give about when it's done right is Mr. Beast. Um, now, for people in the audience who, aren't, who don't know, I mean, Mr. Beast is like one of the most popular people on the internet right now, right? Can you explain for people who, who don't know, like, what does he do and why is it successful? Mm. Mr. Beast is a YouTube influencer. His name's Jimmy Donaldson. Since he was a teenager, he was obsessed with YouTube and with a group of friends, took it on himself to figure out, to crack the code, basically, of what it takes to make successful videos. They obsessed over every single aspect of editing, every frame, um, the title of videos, the images that go with it, and, and just the boldness of idea, the storytelling. And so he he's creates these crazy, audacious, fantastic scenarios of, you know, just something outrageous. Here's an, a huge car dealership that I've set up where people come in and they buy a car and then they're told that the price for it is $50. And, and you film their reaction. And, and those sort of jaw-dropping reactions, turns out that attracts a lot of views. So, so many of his, his videos, I mean, some of them are just outrageous sort of competition games between um, different people, but they're all done in a spirit of fun. And many of them involve kindness, compassion, what we traditionally call charity. He's got a video on how a thousand people were given their sight with cataract surgery that he paid for and the impact that that made on them. So, the videos are incredible. You watch them, you, you can't help but get emotional, which is one reason why they, they, they go viral. Now, of course, he's attracted a storm of critics because you're only doing it for the views. Call this kindness, mate. Come on, you're exploiting these, these blind people. Give them their blindness back. <laughs> um, th it, what people miss is, I mean, look, th there are kindness videos out there that are exploitative, where literally people are ambushed and have some kind act thrust mm. on them and they cry and then they feel exploited. Um, 
I think he's the real deal. I've spoken to the man who runs his philanthropy, um, and um, he, he, he's in this for the long term to do good for the world. And when you look at the numbers, and when you talk to people in the next generation who are so inspired by him, what you realize is that here is a guy who has flouted what has been the traditional way to make a big audience in social media. The way we thought was to spout doom and gloom, to spout hatred, to pour crap on the other side. Mm. Not for him. His way is to spread amazingness. And he is, he is persuading a whole generation of kids that kindness can be cool. Mm. So I'm very excited by that. I think there's re he is exhibit A in the argument that what, however our generation does, I should say mine, not, I'm older than you, but however, however badly we do, there's a generation coming through that is sick of the meanness of the world, wants no part of it, wants to figure out better ways. And he's, he's exhibit A in that, and he's inspired many others to follow suit. Right. And yeah, it is. And, I, and I've read articles of people trying to find fault, trying to find, you know, darkness in his past, or, and, and have come up empty-handed. So right now, Mr. Beast does seem to be a, a pretty, you know, beloved and uncontroversial figure. As you say, though, like a whole load of Mr. Beast copyists have come along and like run up to people on the street and given them flowers. And then, and then they come out and say that, you know, that, was, that they felt exploited and you know, emotionally manipulated. So how come people doing something almost identical to what Mr. Beast is doing are doing it badly? Like, what's the difference? Is it, is it just integrity and, and authenticity? I mean, one, one guardrail is what is the reaction of the people on the other end of the video? Do they feel respected? Are they glad that they participated? Are they glad this event happened? Do they feel delight? Um, so I would, I'd say that's probably the number one test. If they feel exploited, then you're doing something wrong. Mm. Um, so maybe Mr. Beast is just better at it. Like maybe he's just put more hours into, in, into being good at it. He, he's figured out that you can be both genuinely kind and generous and really exciting and interesting. This is, the, this is the code we have to crack. You know, the fundamental problem of media, ever since I was, you know, I'm a media entrepreneur, whatever, the fundamental problem has always been, how do you make good things not boring? Mm. It's not fair that the bad things are more interesting. Yeah. It's not fair that that is the way to win an audience. Damn it, you know, how can you fight that? Well, we have to fight it, and he's figured out one way to fight it, and I think his playbook can be adopted in different ways by many other people. Yeah. And, uh, and is. And you're not, worried, you're not worried that he's an anomaly. Because, uh, you know, you're still in a world, you know, when you talk to YouTube, sort of Joe rogan -y type people, they'll always say that if they have somebody nuanced on, then they get like 10,000 views. But if they have somebody who says that, you know, woke people are a death cult, they get <laughs> half a million views. Yeah, that, definitely a problem. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's this kid who I spoke to who was inspired by Mr. Beast. He's, he's in his 20s. He's called Milad Merck. He's a TikTok influencer. And he was, he was disgusted by this trend that was happening on TikTok of food waste, of huge amounts of food being dumped. Look at the mess I made in my parents' kitchen. Ha, ha, ha. Um, he thought, I know. He got huge amounts of peanut butter, huge amounts of jelly, huge amounts of bread and turned it into handmade sandwiches and wrapped them up and took them on the streets and gave them to people and videoed it. And his video was seen far more times than the trend he was combating. He, he, he single-handedly turned that trend around. And I spoke to him, John, and he said, look, it's not actually symmetric. Any emotion will go viral. You kick someone and film it, it's gonna go viral. But it doesn't last. People think you're a dick. You can be a dick for a day and be famous, or you can work a little bit harder and try and do something that does good, that spreads emotion, and then you'll be remembered and you can build something. Mm. And many of us, he said to me, are interested in building something. So I, I think I was as inspired by him as by any conversation I've had. It's not, this is a fight we can actually win. Mm. And if we don't, they're going to. Um, you had an experiment that you wanted to do on the audience. I think now might be a good interlude for the experiment. <laughs> it was, it's to do with non-financial acts of generosity. Right, 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 right. So giving money is, you know, w often what we think of with generosity, but um, there, there are so many non-financial ways to give, and 
they all start with just a shift of attention. It's, it's the shift of attention away from ourselves to someone else. It's always a little bit awkward. You know, you know that feeling, you're walking down the street and there's someone, should I talk to that person? I, I'm kind of busy and someone else can and I don't want to create dependency, heaven forbid. So, you know, we usually walk on by and stay in our zone. But let's try this. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to turn to someone who you don't know, just, just pair up, and you're going to look at each other. Don't do it yet. You're going to look at each other, into each other's eyes. For... I'm so glad I don't need to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you can look into my eyes, John, anytime you want. The, um, um, for 20 seconds, it will feel like an eternity. And you'll see each other. And after seeing each other, you will ask each other just this one question. Is there something that you need right now? And you can answer that in just a sentence or two, any way you want to, your personal life or business or you know, whatever it is, but just short. And you'll each do that. And then probably nothing more will happen, except just possibly in a few cases, some of you, after this thing is done, will think of some way to continue and maybe talk more about that need, and maybe something will happen. I just love experiments about infectious generosity. And it all starts with just seeing someone, paying attention, and being willing to go through that awkwardness. It's going to be 20 awkward seconds, and then magic, I promise you, can happen. So let's try this. Pair up. Pair up. <laughs> and then we're going to go quiet. Pair up, and then shh. OK. The 20 seconds is starting. The 20 seconds is starting now. Okay, now um, just take turns and ask and answer that question. <laughs> this is amazing, people are really doing it. And are you can. Okay, flip sides, flip sides, other way. Ten seconds. Okay. For those of you who wish to continue this after the event, um, if anything happens from this, I would love it if you email me. I'm chris at ted.com. Just email me and tell me what, what happens, and we'll find maybe some way of amplifying a few of the stories. Mm -hmm. um, but you felt it, right? You felt that awkwardness, and you felt the magic of connecting with another person. It all, it all starts there. It all starts there. After that, all bets are off. Right. That was great. I think everyone did it, right? I, I, so, I, once again, I'm the most socially awkward person in the room. <laughs> because there's no way I would. I'd, I'd, if I was in that audience, I would not have done that. I'd have found a way to not do it. <laughs> um, so, I want to move on to what is, you know, definitely the most provocative. Um, but not, you know, in, in, in a way I completely understand. Um, but it is a really interesting point. Um, you say something, you know, big and surprising, which is that the, the internet tracking and surveilling us and everybody constantly checking our reputations has its upsides and that overall, quote, it's a force for good. 
Now, you're making a, a nuanced point. You know, you're, you're saying that you're very much against the excesses of surveillance culture from the tech companies and, and quote-unquote, cancel culture. So it's not like you've, you know, not seen what's been happening all of these years. Um, but, and one thing I found really interesting is that you equate it to religion. You say that in the absence of religion, people... You know, a good thing about religion was people felt that they were being watched. And now we don't feel like we're being watched, so, yeah. So, it, look, it is a controversial point, and you can blame this on my religious past, if you like. My parents were missionaries. Um, I grew up believing God was watching me every moment of, of every day. And, um, and that really every day, in a way, was a battle between our inner demons and angels. And that, you know, we, we, we had to fight. And, and there was fear in it. There was some fear. Like, if I did something wrong, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, uh, what does that mean? My honest assessment of myself looking back is that that fear, weirdly, helped me be, on many occasions, a slightly better version of myself. And I am worried that in the current... Co one reason why the world is getting a bit meaner is that we've let go of religion. I've, I've let go of religion personally. Uh, we've, we've let it go, and we're trying to build civilization in a brand new experiment that no one's done this in, in, in any time in human history of run societies without any religious space for, for all of the last, you know, thousands of years, as far as we know. Um, the religions have gathered people at least weekly and reminded them to be their best selves. So... <laughs> The question is, can the internet play a role actually in doing that? I, I think the world, in general, a world of growing transparency, I would argue, is good. In terms of countries, it's been good. There's, there's a, a wonderful non-profit called Transparency International that ranks countries according to how corrupt they are. And that has had a material effect in reducing corruption in the world. And I think, even though it's uncomfortable, having it feel like everyone is watching us and that at any point something we do, people could jump on us. I mean, it's horrible being jumped on by the internet, it really is. But it's possible that those safeguards may actually be... It's possible that humans are so screwed up, and we are, honestly, like we're very fragile, weird beings. It's possible we need a little bit, a little bit of fear in our lives to be our best selves. You don't have to believe this to actually except some, some of the rest of the book, put it down to my hands. But, that, but that's, what I, that's what I think. And so I, think, I just think that the, the bigger point, John, is that reputation is the number one currency in this age. And if you, if you commit to being generous, if you commit to giving things away and acting in a generous spirit online, that reputation long term is going to help you, mm. I think. I think it will win you allies, people who want to work with you, people who want to do things with you. That is worth fighting for. I, I thought it was a really interesting and counterintuitive point. And the first time I read it, I thought, well, whoa. And then I read the book a second time. And I thought, huh, yeah, like, I, I, I got it. And, and, you know, and I agree with everything that you, that you just said. You know, I, I, and also, you know, even though I wrote a book about public, you know, this critical of public shaming, I see the importance of shame. I, I think if people do bad things, they, they should feel ashamed. And one of the problems with the modern age is that we've overused our shaming weapon. Yes, yes. And as a result, transgressors have become like hospital superbugs, like impervious to treatment. Mm. They've become these like shame-free. People realize, well, if we just step out of the pact by refusing to feel ashamed, then the shamers have nowhere to go. So we've actually created a world um, and actually, I think something really interesting, um, this isn't my original thought, this is from Katie Herzog, the podcaster, but I, I heard her say that, you know, one positive thing that's come from Elon Musk's Twitter, like not much positive has come from it, but one positive thing is that there isn't that sort of punitive left-wing bullying on Twitter anymore, that's kind of gone. And they've migrated to people at places like Blue Sky, yeah. And, and it's fractured, and they don't have that power anymore. But, yeah. but in its place is, is increasing right-wing bullying of these, like, shameless trolls who just become extreme versions of themselves. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's challenging. It's challenging. You say that, and I agree with it, you say that, you know, being afraid 
that your reputation is going to get destroyed can lead to sensible self-censorship. And I, and I agree, and I think it's positive. You know, we don't want to just be assholes going around insulting people all the time. But I think it can also lead to, to kind of frightened self-censorship, which is a threat to public discourse and free speech. I, so I agree with that too. Like, it's, mm. that there's a line where, that, where the whole thing goes horribly wrong. Uh, the, main, the main point I want to make is that what's amazing about the connected age is that you can be generous, you can spread things far and wide with zero cost. Those things carry with them reputation, and reputation is everything, mm. good, good and bad. But it's the, the potential for to enhance your reputation is, is massive in, in a way that was never possible before. Yeah. There's another downside I wanted to point out, which is that a, a complaint that you hear on the right quite often is the, is the quote, be kind brigade, people like us, um, can often be like the worst. Because uh, <laughs> if you get it wrong, then you're not, you're not displaying empathy you're displaying highly selective empathy. You're displaying empathy for people in your own group who agree with the things that you agree with, but the people who fall outside of our group, we have no empathy at all, and it's creating a world of heroes and villains. Yeah, and I, so I think one of the most important forms of generosity today is people who have the courage to step outside of that but, mode and find a way to listen to people who are other with respect. Just listen to them. And, tr you know, my mother insisted on me, and this was such a powerful lesson. You just can't, you're not allowed to judge someone until you really know their story. And by the way, when you really know their story, you won't judge them. So I think this is profoundly true, and we've, we've, we, we've lost this in, in our righteous certainty about how bad everything is on the other side and so forth. We, we've lost the chance to learn from each other. We've lost our curiosity. And people who, with courage and curiosity, go out there and say, wait a sec, maybe there's something I, I could learn. And maybe we, we have to find ways to bridge between these sides. And so how? Because like, you're, obviously you're speaking you know, my, my language here. This is exactly what I, I feel too. And I guess the question is, like, how? Practically speaking, how? How do you reach out to somebody? It does work. That story I said before about Megan Phelps Roper going on Twitter to proselytize for you know, that crazy church that she belonged to. And in, and, in, and in fact, Twitter took her away from the church. So yeah. it does work. So is it, is it respectful listening? It's certainly not trying to beat people down with arguments, that doesn't work. Yeah, I think it's coming away from the sort of one-line zingers and, 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 the, and the loathing and the snark and the, the performative side of social media to the, to the sort of um, the listening and reasoned side. There's a different mode of conversation you can find when you say, just, I hear you and I, and I think I understand part of why you're saying that, but I'm puzzled about this. Aren't you worried about this? It's, it, as opposed to, look everyone at how ridiculous this person is, is being. Um, it's, it's leading somebody to a place where they will figure it out for themselves, yeah. as opposed to trying to browbeat people into I mean, changing look, their I, opinion. I, I tell the story in the book of this incredible African-American musician, Daryl Davis, who was puzzled by why people hated him because of the color of his skin. So he went and introduced, he, he sought out a meeting with the local leader of the Ku Klux Klan, so this is as bridging as you can get and as crazy, courageous as you can get. They had a meeting, it was terrifying. Somehow they continued to meet, they formed a weird friendship. He went to KKK rallies in his efforts to understand his friend better. His friend ended up leaving the KKK, dozens of others followed. CNN then ran a story on this, which millions of people heard. He's got a TEDx talk that millions of people have seen. So one person's courage has sparked this viral chain reaction of news and shown, I mean, look, if he, if he can bridge with the KKK, I think we can bridge with someone who's, who's pissing us off on X right now. I really think we probably can. And it's, it's just still, it takes courage because people on your own side will try and blow your head off. Don't be so nice to that thug. Well, if we all go that way, 
we're just not going to solve any problems. And, and part, no. of it, part of it, just if you pull the camera back, we are spending so much energy in this one-dimensional tug of war. It's just a battle for power. It's a mud fight. This is ignoring humans' true superpowers, which is to dream of a better future. It's to dream of new possibilities. Where actually, if you, if you reframe the problem, you, people can find ways to maybe work together. And as, as soon as um, people start to actually build something together, even if they disagree about some things, they change how they think of each other. We, we somehow have to get back into that mode. I really think that, or I think we're screwed. I hope, I hope this isn't a difficult question, and feel free to deflect or not answer if it is. Um, but does this, this philosophy of, of you know, not being in a bubble, listening to all voices, bringing other voices in, is that impacting the way that you're curating TED, that you're bringing in voices who you may not have brought in a few years ago? It is. It is. We're, we're, I mean, TED is probably viewed by most people and probably an objective look at... Like, most of the content we have is technology and science, whatever, it's not really political, but the stuff that you could put on a, on a political spectrum, which might be less than a quarter of the content, but of that stuff, most of it leans progressive, for sure. Um, where but you New have York, started to bring in. Exactly. And, so, and they've got into some trouble for it. it in, 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 indeed. Um, I feel quite strongly that we have to be open tent, that we, we can't just apply... Because the world's getting more and more politicised to the point where... If people perceive you in one camp, they won't even listen to you. You're, you're, you're done. And so your chance of persuading the people you most want to persuade is, is gone. That, that's, that's no good. So, no, we're determined to take the very uncomfortable path of trying to find voices that are uncomfortable to our progressive audience and say, could we learn something from this person? I mean, it's a question for you, you know, is it possible to, simultane to, do, is it possible to do these two things? strongly disagree with someone, strongly dislike someone, if you like, but also learn something from them. Mm. I think it might be. Um, we're definitely trying to find out, and, and I think... And it's been causing a, a, some ructions. It's, 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 it's definitely causing ructions. It's also causing delight and excitement, because there, there, are, there are some people who don't like, you know, that you know, we've, we've, we've sort of drifted into one particular part. They, they want Ted. We're a nonpartisan organization, and uh, so I'm, de I'm determined to keep it that way, and it's, I find it very, very, very exciting. I think the next TED is going to be the most controversial we've had, probably, and I think it's going to be great for that, for, for that reason. Uh, I want to end with something really interesting and something that I very much agree with. You say a few times in the book that generosity, like an act of generosity, can make you feel happy in a way that you don't anticipate, you know, until you do it. And I've got to say, it bears it out. I'm about to tell a story about how amazing I am. I was on a, I was on a train and it was like chaos. I was coming back from Cardiff and I had a seat, but there were like 400 people who didn't. And there was an old lady right in front of me who was clearly like getting more and more pained. And I, I offered her my seat. And she was like, oh, no, 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 it's fine, don't worry. And I was going, no, no, I've sat down for long enough. It's, you know, please sit down. And she did. And for the rest of the day, I, I, honestly, I was bouncing around with joy. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think if I hadn't done it, I would have felt real guilt, the kind of religious guilt that you talk about a little bit in, in the book. Um, I'm sure there's a kind of element of OCD to it, a kind of scrupulosity, a fear of doing the wrong thing morally. So there was that. I, w I avoided feelings of guilt. And it just made me feel so happy to have done the right thing. I, I was surprised by how happy it, it made me. So it's a, it's a really, really weird part of our psychology, actually, that um, we don't fully predict how much happiness comes from, from being kind. Like, most of our psychology, you know, we think, if I get that thing I've been dreaming of, I know that's going to make me happy. And we know that you know, I fall in love with someone, if, if I can persuade that person to love me, I'm going to be happy. That part, that part is true. Um, the, but when it comes to generosity, even though we're wired to be generous, it, we, we also have these other feelings like loss aversion that muddle us and get in the way of really understanding the full set of, of benefits. So no, it, if you, it turns out 
that one of the keys to a life of meaning and a life of happiness, along with meaningful work and nature and good relationships and so forth, but right up there, one of the four or five top things is to be generous. Um, we're, we're wired to do it. And, and after the event, this little whisper says, wow, um, I like this version of myself. Well done you, you know, this is great. Mm. And, and it makes it easier to do it the next time. Um, it's, 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 a really, it's a really beautiful thing. And it's, it's, a, it's a fact about us that I just wish was widely known. I mean, it should be one of the first things that's taught in school and in life yeah. and so forth. Because we, we honestly need every little piece that we can get to help us go down this journey. It's hard to come out of our busy, stressful lives and try and spend any attention on anything else than that. It's really hard to do. So if generosity you... can make your business more successful in tangible, money-making ways, and it can make your mental health better by just making you feel more, more happy. Uh, and you've, you end your book with... Um, uh, you say that you've started... There's a, there's a theme in your book about, you know, we're living in a post-religious age, and you, you say that... Um, I think it was Alan de Botan says that, you know, atheists should practice some things that religious people practice, mm. like meeting once a week, and you are doing that yourself. You're tithing, you're giving away 10% of your, of, of your income. <laughs> there's, um, there are actually two big religious traditions out there for, for giving away money. Um, the Judeo-Christian tradition is tithing 10%. Uh, the Islamic tradition, uh, zakat, is to give one fortieth of your net worth, of your wealth, each year, two and a half percent. You know, for people who are wealthier, that is a much more challenging ask, actually. And so what I suggest in the book is, look, these religions have actually, these amounts are a kind of messy compromise of between a, a challenging moral duty and what people can actually manage to do if they really try. And for me, they actually have a huge benefit of if you, if you put that out there as a thing that you should do, and when you've done that, your financial obligations are satisfied. That gets you out of the guilt that I have personally felt my whole life of that generosity is, is an invitation to a pit of endless obligation. Like, you can never enjoy a latte again because there's someone on the other side of the world who could have used that money. I, I, that kind of obligation is never going to spread. You know, we have to deal with humans as they are. You have to do things that, moral rules that people can aspire to. Religions have proved that people can achieve these goals. So, what would happen if you adopted and said, okay, you're a non-religious person, do you want your ethical standards to be at least as high as those of religious people? I vote yes on that. And that means you, there's a case that you should adopt the higher of those two standards. And if people did that, by the way, if, if a third of people did that who were comfortably off, it would raise so much philanthropy that every single problem outstanding to humans could be tackled to the extent that philanthropy can make a difference. There's an absolutely, like for me, the whole philanthropic conversation should shift from obligation to thrilling dreams about how we can make the world better. So yeah, so, so I have signed up on that pledge. There's a website, givingwhatwecan.org, that you can go onto it and you can make a public signing and you, we kind of need that to sort of, you know, keep us honest to it. But um, I got a lot of joy from it and it's actually taken away a, a lot of my guilt. I think this is, I can do this, it's, it's challenging, but I can do it, and, um, and I can proselytize it and, and try and encourage others to do it, because I, I, I just think it's, a, it's an achievable moral standard, not for everyone in every stage of life, but people who have got to the point where we're reasonably comfortable, that is, that is an, a laudable and achievable goal. Well, I found, I found your book fascinating and thoughtful and inspiring and sometimes provocative and very necessary for this horrific age that we're hopefully coming out of. Um, so thank you. And, and we now have 25 minutes for, for questions. There's a few questions coming in from online, but I don't Does anybody have any questions in the audience? I can see somebody. Should, should we have the house lights on for the questions? Uh, and there's somebody, yes, hi. Just, 
Uh, is there a mic? Is there a yeah. roving mic? Apparently yeah. there is. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I quite agree with you about uh, generosity and the way it leads to gratitude, which leads to more generosity. Absolutely. I've known that in my own life and benefited hugely from it. Um, I'm also very optimistic that ideas can make the world a better place. And I want to offer you very generously uh, a free idea because <laughs> I know it works. I've done it again in my own life. And I know you have the right connections to make it work more generally. Um, and that is that, yes, you're right that people love giving away money to good causes. They also love commemorating people and celebrating people. If when the Queen died, Prince Charles, the King, had said, I am putting five million pounds into a fund to plant trees, and I would like anyone else who respected or cared about the Queen to give money to it, there would have been a billion pounds in a charity to plant trees. If Charles. David Attenborough had a clause in his will that said, uh, if you've enjoyed my documentaries and would like to help uh, with environmental or climate causes, please give to uh, his charity. Again, there would be a huge amount of money. Uh, the same yeah. would apply for Mick or Paul or Obama or any of these people, and it could become a fashion uh -huh. among very famous people such as you know. Well, and thank we could you. have a huge in, amount of generosity. money on a regular basis. Infectious generosity via commemoration like that. But yeah, thank you. Oh. Thank uh, you for the question. Okay, <laughs> there's a... There's a, a, a <laughs> down here in the front row, then after that a gentleman right behind, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, slightly weird question. Um, I'm a person with a disability and quite often people inflict their kindness and generosity on me and it's unwanted, it's generally unhelpful. Um, that thing that people don't really know what they're doing, they're just doing it because they feel like they should. Mm. How, how yeah. would you respond to that? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it speaks to the point about you know, how Mr. Beast does it well, but then his copyists don't. And, that, and there's a very fine line, it feels, between doing it well and doing it badly. I mean, people, it's, it's probably done from good intention. You know, the question is, is that you don't feel respected when they, when they do it. It feels a little bit demeaning. And I, and I think it is a, it, it's a challenge generally in culture. Like, I, I, I think there's actually a generosity in receiving a gift to assume good intent from the person and, and respond as well. So it's very, it's very awkward. Like, I think, I think you should... Like, help, help us understand what, what is the way that people should and can best respect you and celebrate you? Um, is, it, is there a different kind of help that should be given? I think, I think part of it is just we've, we've got to get better at having honest conversations with, with each other. And, and it's very helpful to hear from you right now that, you know, that if you see someone who's in need, like, it's not necessarily true that the best thing you should do is, is, is kind of insult them by doing something that they actually could, they're perfectly capable of doing themselves. But we need to get wiser on this. You've inspired me. I think, I think we need to, I need to find um, someone who can give some kind of playbook of what is the line between kindness and respect. And it sounds like you, so write to me and tell me what that is. <laughs> uh, hi, do you have a mic in your hand? Uh, oh, you do now. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about how phil philanthropy in the past is, uh, can be used to obscure slightly dodgy tax arrangements by various billionaires. Yeah. <laughs> Including, you know, people who've yeah. come to TED. <laughs> yeah, so, so big philanthropy is, is, is a huge issue, and it's, it's regarded with so much um, cynicism and for, um, totally un understandable <clears throat> reasons. <clears throat> First of all, we all resent wealth inequality um, and, and the fact that some people may get a tax benefit or reputation benefit, you know, is, is there, there are so many reasons to be angry at, um, uh, at big philanthropy. I 
push back on it a bit in the book because um, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that I, I think it's going to take forever to press for a world where fair taxes are paid and say, you know, we tax away billionaires and just let governments solve all the problems that can be solved. First of all, I'm not even sure that governments, their track record of solving big problems isn't that great either. Um, and I've spent, I have spent time talking to people who are rich, including billionaires, and they have, some of them are, you know, questionable intent, let's say, but, but a lot genuinely are committed to trying to figure out how to, how to give back publicly. And so my feeling actually is that, is that our stance should be not don't do that, don't give away money like that. It should be to encourage m much more philanthropy from them. With this, with this caveat, to engage, to accept and agree that everyone should have a stake in how that philanthropy is planned and dreamed of. I think what's really annoying is the thought that some rich person on a whim can choose how to change the world. Um, and so, you know, I've, I mean, I've been involved in this thing called the Audacious Project, where we try and find projects that are independently sourced. We, we go to heroic people who are out there at the cliff face trying to change the world for the better and say to them, instead of going through all these god-awful fundraising meetings, spending half your time doing that, what could you and your team achieve if money was no object? You get amazing answers from them. You get those ideas that put goosebumps on, on the back of your neck. Help turn those into workable plans and then go to rich donors and say, OK, this independently, these are amazing ideas. Will you support these? And what I've found is that there is a form of infectious generosity, which is amazing to see, which is when you bring a group together and say, how about this? One person will say, OK, I'm persuaded. And others will come in, ping, 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 and ping. And it is actually beautiful to see. And they, they find the process inspiring. And I don't know, I, I, my vision of what the, I, I think there's a huge role in the future for more philanthropy of the right kind. I think there's a class of problems that the market can't solve, that governments so far have done a terrible job of solving, and that it needs big dreams and big money to try to do it. And I think when you see those problems solved, it's actually thrilling. There's a satellite launching in a couple of weeks' time that was funded by this very process that it's, it's a thing, you know, like the size of a washing machine. It will detect methane emissions uh, around the entire planet to a much greater level of precision than is possible before so that companies can be identified. They can find it and turn off the loss of this valuable product to them. This is a product which is causing pretty much as much global warming in the short term as CO2. Like, it's a terrible problem. It's funded by a bunch of rich donors getting excited by a very carefully elaborated plan from the Environmental Defense Fund to do it. And there are so many other big, exciting ideas like that out there. So I, I say don't let, we spend so much time snarking and getting annoyed. Let's do it the other way. Let's get excited about the possibilities here and urge people with resources to raise their game. And I, th I think we'll all feel better. And I think yeah. problems well, get solved. Well, you say there's no perfect way of giving. There's, there's all... no perfect way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, gentlemen there with the, with the beard. Thanks for the uh, engaging talk, guys. Um, <clears throat> attention is the currency. Uh, we're reducing everything to sound bites. And I think the technologies don't cater really for nuance. You know, I have, when we talk about courage, you know, I've had the courage to stand up and ask, ask this question. So the sort of Mr. Beast replicas, do, does Mr. Beast just have very thick skin? How, how do we deal with the, the sort of deficiency in handling nuance? Yeah, I think he does. <laughs> but he's also got, he, look, he puts out a, a video and then clicks back an hour later and five million new people watched it. That, that thickens your skin right there. That, like, <laughs> you know you're doing something right. I think, I, think with, I think with so many things, it's a muscle. You know, I've been 
online shamed. It is the most horrifying thing. It makes you want to throw up and whatever. But it strengthens you for the next time. And, uh, yeah. and, and so I, I just think we, we start. Start with something small and then raise, raise the stakes a little bit each time. And I, I, I've got to say, if you are being online shamed, like I've been online shamed, and once in a while, you know, you read the comments, um, and you think, OK, yeah, they've got a point. And I think a little bit of humility rather than constant, like, fuck you, you know, doubling down, escalating rage, that sort of narcissistic rage that I think most of the leaders of the culture war suffer from. Um, I, I, there is another way, and I think, you know, sometimes listening to, yeah. to, you know, sometimes if you're being publicly shamed, maybe they've got a bit of a point. I, 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 and I say that personally, like, I, so you've been, my book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, had, had one criticism that I thought, yeah, you know what, that's a kind of hard... They said, somebody yeah. said it was too situational, my book was too situational and it wasn't systemic enough, it wasn't enough about systemic problems. And yeah. I thought, okay, that's a very good point. So, yeah, I think a bit of humility too is, is yeah, probably good I, in I completely situations. agree with that. I've, I've learned from critics. I think, I think a useful thing that I try and keep in my head is discomfort is a proxy for progress. Like, it, you, you sometimes just need that kick to, to make the hard decisions. Yeah. Um, hi, there's a, a woman who's here with a arm up with black... Yes. Hi. We watch a lot of Mr. Beast in our house, so <laughs> all good there. I just had a question on something you mentioned about um, religion and societies. I used to work in Soviet Russia, and there was a real sort of absence of religion there. And there was a lot of sort of anecdotes you know, if you don't work, you don't eat, which the government had introduced to try and sort of replace that moral sort of lethargy. So I just wanted to know if you had any comments on that or any thoughts that there was actually an experiment about a lack of religion. Not sure we should make godless Russia a sort of moral example here. I, like, I, I haven't heard that that actually worked that well. Um, <coughs> But it, is, it shows, you know, that like, it's, it's just, it's hard. You know, if you don't, motivating humans to survive life in the modern era, it's just hard. It's like, that's the first thing, life is hard. It, it, we evolved for a different world. And by the way, that world was even more terrifying. Um, life is hard for most creatures. And we, we it's a, a lot, you know, it's, it's adopt the right assumption. And, um, and, and right there, things can start to get better. Any, any good thing that happened, arguably, is a reason to feel a little bit of gratitude and, and, and joy. Um, but I, I may be missing some of the, the key brilliance of that particular model, but I, I, I'm not advocating at this point. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, gentlemen there in, in the plaid. God, I'm bad at describing what people... <laughs> That's okay, I'll take the plaid. Um, <laughs> there have been quite a lot of scandals with charities over the past few years. Mm. Millions of people donate money to a charity and then money goes missing or it's misused. And mm. you can argue about whether that's deliberate or a misstep. I'm an optimist, I like to think often it's a misstep. But that's eroded a lot of trust in charities. So how do you make sure you're donating to the right cause or how do we rebuild trust in charities so people continue to be philanthropic? Yeah, and can I add something to that question, a question that came in um, online, which is what do you think of the effective altruism movement? And obviously mm. the effective altruism movement took a bit of a bashing with Sam Bankman fried recently. Yeah, it, it did. So look, one problem with, with charity, most people's charitable giving right now, is that we do it on impulse. You know, you, you see a some tragedy on TV and you think, oh my gosh, I've got to text my 100 pounds or whatever it is. Um, and um, what, what, I, what I argue for is that we need to be more reflective in what we do. We can't just, like, these feelings of empathy that we have, super powerful, super important, they can motivate us, but we need to shape it. As with everything, bring your reflective mind to bear. And that includes checking out who you're, who you're giving money to. I think the stories about charitable, you know, loss or, or, you know, disaster or mishandling, probably as a percentage of total charitable giving, are probably way overwrought. I think there's a glee that 
uh, some, some journalist taken discovering something. I mean, it's, and anything you can do to have a reason not to give charitably is probably a great thing to, to, you know, to notch up. But I also think that there is an order of magnitude difference or more between charities that are effective and those that aren't. So effective altruism, I mean, if, look, if you ask the basic question, do we, would we rather our altruism was effective or not effective? I'd rather mine was effective. And so if you, if you talk to people like Will McCaskill, the founder of, of EA, he will say, at heart, we are not a set of, you know, this is what you must give to. We're a process. We're a process for saying to people, here's how you can figure out whether what you're doing is effective. And he asks great questions like, you know, is this a big problem that really needs solving? Has this organization come up with a really powerful way of solving that problem? And is this a problem that is already plenty funded? Um, so, so there are smart questions you can ask. There's one question which people tend to ask, which is a terrible question to ask, which is, am I certain this is the best possible use of my charitable money? The answer to that question will always be no. You can, you can never know what all the other possible uses are. And this question is regularly used to delay giving. So a much better question is, is am I pretty confident that this is a good use of my charity. Because here's the thing, the chances are, I mean, nothing is risk-free. The chances are having money out there in the world, supporting someone who has given their life to trying to make the world a better place, is probably a better place for it than sitting sleepily in your bank account. This doesn't apply to everyone. Many people are fighting you know, to get through the month. That is, that is good. There are other ways to be generous. But for people who do have money, that's sleeping in their bank account, for God's sake, you know, at least think, think about it. And it's worth investing the time to find the charities that are credible. Um, find, find the communities, like supporting a nonprofit for the long term means joining a community of other supporters. There's huge joy in that, by the way, and you will learn from them. No, I've known this founder for years, they are the real deal. That's where I get confidence. Oh, there's somebody over there, yeah, uh, wearing a kind of white um, uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Coat. Coat. <laughs> <laughs> um, firstly, massive thank you. Um, I feel moved beyond words by a lot of what you've said. Um, and my question speaks to a number of themes that have come up in the questions. Um, I found myself in this weird situation a few years ago of um, running a philanthropic organization for a wealthy private equity, equity guy. And I s sensed early on that the money wasn't necessarily going, or there was something, it wasn't quite right, didn't feel right. So I did this mapping thing. And I sort of looked at a few foundations and trusts, and I came up with these two axes. One was intervention, and the other one was longevity. And it seemed to me that there was possibly a way of understanding the effectiveness of um, philanthropy that looked at these two axes. And I want to ask you, based on everything that you've done, everything that you've said tonight, the fear that a couple of people who've asked questions about the horrible tax <coughs> evasions and why would people be so stupid treating people with disabilities in a certain way. Could you do something with your tech knowledge to do a mapping exercise and spread the word widely using an algorithmic intelligence that would show all those seemingly generous, lovely private equity men and women um, actually whether their money and whether their intention of getting super involved when they didn't know what they were talking about was actually going into any good at all. And could you be the person to actually move the dial <laughs> with effective philanthropy? With great pleasure. Next, possibly <laughs> next Tuesday. I mean, <laughs> I mean, look, this is... It, the future is really hard to, to shape reliably. It is, it is hard to know for sure how to act so as to make change. We live in this world full of these complex systems. Everything is, has some uncertainty to it. Everything can have unintended consequences. So um, I, I, I think the, our best shot is actually, it's not one person, it's, it's all of us embracing the fact that this is actually a really important and exciting conversation. Spend more time 
talking about it with each other. And, and we can get to wisdom, at least enough wisdom, as to what we individually can do. And thank you so much for your nice comments as well. Thank you. Um, oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, there's two things I forgot to say. Please tweet, it's a bit late now, but please tweet about the event <laughs> using the hashtag IQ2. And um, also, online audience, um, you can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A button under the video screen, <laughs> then press send. Um, we only have five minutes left, left, so I've kind of screwed that up. Hi. Hi. So you talked about, like, the pros and cons of the sort of surveillance internet, and I think a lot of the conversation of that has evolved around, like, being very anti-cancel culture. And so recently, especially for me, the conversation about anti-bullying at my school has become really just like, if someone does something that's upset you, you just need to forgive them instantly. Like, you can't like, be upset with them, you can't stop being friends with them, like, cancel culture is just completely bad, and I don't think that that's very productive. Like, no, the that that's the pendulum swinging <laughs> yeah. very wildly. Yeah. How do you think that the conversation should be talked to young people like myself? Because I don't think that the way that it's done is working right now. C curiosity, like, pe people are always, you know, people, I, I'm, I think curiosity and patience but if you're being bullied, then, you know, yeah. people should feel shame for doing bad things. Yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing that says that people who are bad actors should be let off the hook. Yeah. You know, generosity is inside us, kindness is inside us, but it is also packaged with a strong sense of fairness. Every human culture does not allow cheaters and freeloaders. That's bad. You know, you, we, we have to have means of dealing with them appropriately. So it's that there's no one-size-fits-all thing here. Try to find kindness. Try to find good intention in what someone does. But if, if someone is really being obnoxious and it's not there, then, then we mm. need collectively to let them know that. Mm. Hi. There's, a, uh, there's one coming right there. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the amazing talk. Uh, the, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, your opinion about the idea of, in, when it comes to philanthropy with the purpose of economic redistribution of wealth, what is your view on the idea that I can redistribute wealth by spending? So, for example, we live in London, so every time you go to theater, you're supporting actors and actresses and anyone in that domain versus making a donation to an art institute. So I, I know it's a long debate, but I'm curious to know what you think. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think, I think transactional spending in an economy, I mean, if you believe Adam Smith, you know, all boats rise to a certain extent. You're helping create jobs and so forth. You're also getting back direct benefit yourself. And, and I think a lot of our spending is perfectly healthily done that way. I just think there's also a category for different kinds of spending where you don't get an immediate benefit back, which allows you more flexibility as to who to support. And there's whole categories of organizations that can't give back services or immediate material goods to the people who donate them, but who are doing amazing work. We, we, we need both. Now, does anybody have... Uh, we've got time for just one more question. Does anybody have a question that they know, well, it's going to have to be you because you put your arm up in the most vociferous way. But I'm hoping this final question... I hope your question is going to be... Uh, amazing. Yeah, you. Amazing. It's going to be like an amazing last it's an amazing question. question. It's going to leave people on a... On a on like uh, a wave, like a <laughs> surfing wave I, of I'm feeling it, John. Joy. I'm feeling yes. it. Well, now I'm nervous. <laughs> My question was, um, so one of the things you talked about, um, I thought was a really great idea, this um, concept of radical generosity. And if we can um, give away our ideas or our art, for example, that that could um, cause ripple effects. But I couldn't help but think a little bit about the debate going on at the moment about AI. And for example, um, how these AI algorithms that are producing art are kind of using the artwork of, of artists without compensating them for that. And so my question is, is that then maybe like a question of short term versus long term, as in, in the short term, I guess a lot of artists are being screwed over, but in the long term, it's creating this AI algorithm that could mm. be abused to the world. Is that 
a yeah. debate, or, or what are your thoughts? It's a very good question, because actually you speak a bit about this in, in the book, and it's another sort of slightly provocative point that you make about whether AI is going to make things worse or whether AI could fix the problem. So I think that's a very, this is a very good yeah. place to end on. I mean, AI is, is changing the world so, so quickly that I, I definitely, no one can really claim to be an, an expert of any kind on this. I think um, I, my main advice to anyone is just to play very, very close attention. And if you can spend time with some of the AI tools and just play with them, because the chances are that if you can figure out the language of prompting and, and kind of thinking about what pulls the best of AI, it's, it's going to be incredibly beneficial to you. Um, there's no simple answer to your, to your question. I think it's horrible that some artists and creatives are going to get, in a way, ripped off by it and are going to have to radically change how they do their work. Others, many other people who have a creative bug in them, will be able to be amazingly creative thanks to AI. There's going to be basically be massive changes, and we need to look out for each other and pay attention to each other. Um, it, it's, 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 it's going to be wild. The, the future may or may not be horrible or wonderful. It's definitely going to be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of radical generosity, one simple thing, honestly, that you could do if you don't do anything else, if this is all kind of overwhelming, is just engage in the ancient generosity tradition of hospitality. Invite six friends to dinner and just have a great time together and have a single conversation around that table about what do you care about and what do you, in our local community, who have you noticed who could maybe use some help? Is there something cool going on in our community that we could help? I promise you that the act of collaborating with a group of people, noticing something and going in together and maybe surprising that person with support, it will light up their life, it will light up your life, and it may make a huge ripple effect across the community. That would be a beautiful, beautiful piece of radical generosity to just try it as an experiment. And, you know, and if something happens, honestly, let me know. We're trying, I think all of us, we need to do this stuff, and then we need to share stories. You hear a story about something, share it. You may not get John's views ever. I won't ever get your, your, your views. You're, you're, I mean, your five million oh. listens. Right. Listens to your I podcast. You my opinions. You know, no, no. You are, you, are, you are Mr. Ripple Maker Extraordinary. And I, and, <laughs> well, thank and, and, you. But, but you will make ripples. You will make ripples. And, it will, and, and collectively, that could be really beautiful. Well, I've got to say, um, I, I was intimidated. When Chris asked me to do this, one of the reasons why I, I was intimidated was because I don't know if anybody's ever seen Chris interview somebody on stage. I think Chris is the best on stage interviewer that I've ever seen. And so to be his on stage interviewer was a very intimidating thing. But I think you, 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 you told. You, you did a wonderful job of talking about your book, which is so necessary. In these, help, in these horrendous times, and I really hope that people were inspired by some of the things that, that Chris said and enjoyed the conversation. And uh, Chris will be signing books in the back of the room, um, former church in our post-religious society. Um, <laughs> I, so please do uh, stick around and, and meet Chris and get your book signed. And thank you all so much for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you Chris. Thank you.